Good afternoon, everyone. It's really great to see the turnout. Um, I'm Keith McNeil. I'm an so associate professor of anthropology in the Department of Comparative Cultural Studies. This series is part of the Comparative Cultural Studies Department Colloquium series. It's also a guest uh, uh, presentation for the Interdisciplinary History Anthropology course that my colleague, Professor Kristen Winterstein in History and I are co-teaching um, on critical issues in Gulf Coast history, and we're taking a, an extra special look at the impact of Harvey in Houston, but also Katrina in New Orleans and Maria in Puerto Rico. Um, we also have honors college folks in the crowd, so this is like a, it's a nice opportunity for um, students in different programs, different departments, to come together, learn together, and think together. So thanks for being here. I don't usually write introductions, but I did in this, this time. <laughs> um, hurricanes are androgynously named in the taxonomic system at work in the English-speaking world. But this one was called Harvey. He was not only the third 500-year storm in as many years, but was also the biggest rainstorm in, in US history dumping more than 50 inches of rain over a very short period of time that also seemed to last forever. The English name Harvey derived from Old Breton linguistic influences whose roots invoke meanings of both blazing and iron. Harvey, in other words, is a blazing iron. It is also pop the name Harvey is also popularly taken to mean battle-worthy. How fitting. The storm came and went, but what about the disaster? Harvey didn't just come and go. On the contrary, he came to stay. But when did he arrive? Do we know? Why not? <clears throat> Recall that we had remarkably accurate weather forecasting prior to the storm itself, and that Houston had experienced massive storms and epic flooding countless times before. In March 2016, Grist, along with ProPublica and the Texas Tribune, published Houston is a sitting duck for the next big hurricane. Why isn't Texas ready? This means that the omnipresent disaster called Harvey was a failure to comprehend, not a failure to forecast. Indeed, too many of us find ourselves illiterate when it comes to disaster. Fortunately, the anthropology of disaster and reconstruction has been on the move since the 1970s, developing a critical vision and comparative database that offer, that offer disaster literacy in, in increasingly urgent times. Hashtag climate change. <laughs> Equally fortunately, I am pleased to introduce Dr. Roberto Barrios, Associate Professor of Anthropology at Southern Illinois University in Carbondale, an applied anthropologist who has already distinguished himself as one of the leaders in the anthropology of disaster. His first book, called Governing Affect, Neoliberalism and Disaster Reconstruction, published in 2017 by the University of Nebraska Press, takes a trenchant comparative look at the aftermath of four major disasters in the Western Hemisphere. Honduras after Hurricane Mitch, post-Katrina New Orleans, Chiapas, Mexico after a massive landslide, and Southern Illinois after epic Mississippi River flooding. A blurb on the back of the book captures his contribution better than I could. Quote, the ethnographic cases in governing affect highlight how reconstruction programs, government agencies, and recovery experts often view post-disaster contexts as opportune moments to transform disaster-affected communities through principles and practices of modernist and neoliberal development. Governing affect brings policy and politics into dialogue with human emotion to provide researchers and practitioners with an analytical toolkit for apprehending and addressing issues of difference, voice, and inequity in the aftermath of catastrophes." End quote. Just after Hurricane Harvey, Dr. Barrios and a colleague quickly applied and received NSF rapid funding, immediately commencing a fieldwork project on the afterlife of Harvey in Houston. Thus today, we have the extraordinary opportunity to hear a live report from the front lines of investigation. He offers data and analysis, therefore literacy. For learning to see what lies below the surface is a critical part of disaster literacy. I give you Dr. Roberto Barrios.
Hello, everyone. So I would like to begin by thanking Keith and thanking Kristen for the wonderful invitation and opportunity to come to your beautiful campus and your beautiful city and share with you the progress on the work that we've been doing. As Dr. McNeil mentioned, this is a project that's been funded by the National Science Foundation. Uh, in terms of research, we applied for this grant immediately following Harvey. Uh, we obtained funds uh, in late September 2017 and our first ethnographic visit to Houston was in October 2017. Since then, uh, we have conducted uh, different short phases of research and some medium length phases of research. We first arrived for only a week in, in October 2017. Uh, we came back for two weeks in January 2018. We spent two full months, uh, June and July, in Houston in summer 2018. We returned uh, then in January 2019 of this year for another two weeks of research and uh, this visit we have actually also conducted some ethnographic interviews so the research is ongoing and we, we plan to come back with our research team in late May, early June. One of the things I want to say really quickly is doing ethnographic research helps you come to know cities and places in ways that you didn't know them before. My experience of Houston prior to uh, Hurricane Harvey had not necessarily been a positive one. Uh, I am a transnational migrant that was born in Central America, in Guatemala, uh, in 1974. In 1980, my parents packed up everything that we had and we drove a, an old station wagon uh, across Mexico and into the United States, uh, seeking refuge from a very violent civil war. And my first experience of Houston was that these were the days before GPS existed. <laughs> Guatemala is a very gender society. My father was the only person in the family who drove, and uh, he drove 40 miles an hour across Mexico. It took us four, four days, and whenever, there was no AC in the car, and whenever my father got tired, we had to stop and wait for him to finish taking this nap in the heat. And my parents were also very overprotective, so my sister and I couldn't step out of the station wagon to go play. Imagine driving through Houston. Uh, you. Uh, don't have experience driving through a super highway system of the United States uh, without GPS and you don't speak the language very well. So getting through Houston was, a, was in itself an adventure uh, or, or maybe an adventure is not the right word to put it. Uh, it was almost a tragedy. Um, <laughs> and to this day, many of my colleagues uh, have very negative perspectives on Houston. Houston has all kinds of representations outside of its city in terms of how other Americans perceive it. As a matter of fact, if somebody were to ask me prior to this research project, name four American cities, Houston would probably not be the first city to come to mind, right? I would think of Chicago, I would think of San Francisco, I would think of New York City. And yet Houston is one of the largest metropolitan areas in the country, right? It's also a seat of power for energy companies. And it's also a seat of political power. It's an incredibly strategically important politically and also socially important city. Uh, and it's a city with fascinating people. And it's a city that I have only come to know in the way that I have come to know it through my ethnographic work. And this applies to every city that I have ever lived in. My family moved to the city of New Orleans when I was, well, we tried to leave Guatemala when I was six years old. At, at that time, um, there was a clandestine war that was being supported by the U.S. State Department in a clandestine fashion. So uh, the U.S. State Department and the CIA uh, in, it were illegally or uh, not publicly supporting uh, a genocidal war on the part of the Guatemalan government against its own people. So as Central Americans, uh, we could not qualify for political asylum, even though the priest that was supposed to give me my first communion at the age of six disappeared mysteriously uh, because he had been named as a leftist collaborator by another priest the night before my first communion. Uh, even though the teachers that my mother worked with, uh, who belonged to the teachers union in Guatemala City, had had their partners killed, they themselves had been kidnapped and tortured by the Guatemalan government. Um, the Guatemalan government had gone to great lengths to destroy Guatemalan civil society. So when we think about the so-called migration crisis that we're thinking, that we're seeing today, we have to understand that that migration crisis is greatly of the making of U.S. foreign policy in Central America. Uh, U.S. foreign policy went through great lengths to destroy civil society in countries like Guatemala, Honduras, and El Salvador. And that's the reason why people are coming today. Just a little side note. But, but, but nonetheless, um, so we, we came here for six months and then we figured out that we couldn't actually apply for political asylum and my father had too much pride uh, and I don't think my father is right. I don't think pride is a good thing. 
But he had too much pride to remain in the United States without a formalized immigration status, so he decided to pack up the van and head back to Guatemala after six months of staying here. We went back to Guatemala and we lived in Guatemala through some of the worst of the violence. Uh, up until 1987 when our visas finally were approved and then we packed up the same station wagon and drove across <laughs> Mexico one more time. Uh, uh, by that time I was a, uh, you know, I was a marathon uh, road tripper by that point. Five days in the station wagon, no problem. Still didn't have AC. Um, <laughs> and we went to live in this wonderful city called New Orleans and that, that city in a way shaped me into the person that I am today and, and I probably would not have been an anthropologist had I not had the experience of being an immigrant in the United States because growing up in Guatemala I had the equivalent of what in the United States we might call white male privilege, except that I had what we would call white, not white, Ladino, urban Ladino male privilege, uh, along the lines of ethnicity and gender that our society was structured. And I, had, I enjoyed all kinds of privileges, although we were not necessarily a very wealthy family, but, and yet I still benefited from my social positionality in relationship to women, in relationship to indigenous populations. Uh, and it was not until I had the experience myself of being perceived not as a Ladino with a D, but a Latino with a T, uh, and being seen as, as a very different uh, type of ontology, as a very different type of person, and experiencing discrimination, that that led me to seek for a profession that would help me understand why do people make certain worlds and not others? Why do we naturalize what are ultimately historically created distinctions, right, of, of ethnicity, gender, race, and class? Um, but it was not until Hurricane Katrina affected New Orleans. So I, I, I went to high school in, in the greater New Orleans area. I got my undergraduate degree from the University of New Orleans. Then I went off to the University of Florida to get my master's and PhD. I did my dissertation research in Honduras, as Dr. McNeil mentioned. Uh, and it wasn't until 2005 that Hurricane Katrina hit New Orleans and 80% of the city flooded. And then many of my friends and colleagues said, you know, Roberto, you should really do a project in New Orleans. And I did not know my, my city in the way that I came to know it prior to that until I had to do an urban ethnography of disaster recovery. So urban anthropology, uh, disaster recovery research makes you go into places, talk to people, make contact with folks, help propel their voices in ways that you otherwise probably wouldn't have an excuse, that you would otherwise probably question yourself. Right? Well, that's what I love about anthropology, that it gives me the, the reason, the motivation, the necessity of walking up to a house of a person that I would never otherwise think of engaging and asking them about their lives, asking them to share with me uh, and getting to know people uh, and their experiences that I otherwise wouldn't and, and therefore coming to know my city in ways that I wouldn't. So let's talk a little bit about this particular project that I want to present to you today. And I titled my, my talk, Cacophony of Disasters. And this is a, a concept or an idea that I've been wrestling with uh, and I'm hoping that you find it worth thinking about. Sometimes I present things and people say, well, isn't that a truism? How, how is that science? Well, you know, I always start by saying anthropology is not a science, it's anthropology. <laughs> and, and sometimes we pride ourselves in not being scientific. But that's another discussion, another debate for another day. Um, but one of the things that has impressed me o over the last couple of years is this kind of cultural trend that we have um, that we expect people in the aftermath of a catastrophe, especially policymakers, political leaders, social leaders, to come up with a narrative, to come up with a story of how their city is doing, how their community is doing. And one of the things that I have found over the course of my research, because as an ethnographer, uh, although I, I was saying anthropology is not a science, anthropologists who do what we call the anthropology of science often say, although we might not be very scientific on the surface at times, anthropologists share the same challenge as scientists do, which is you go out and you collect data, you go out and you collect information, but the, the data itself is, is not the end result of how you disseminate information and knowledge. You as the social scientist or as the hard scientist have to come up with a story. You, you have to figure out how to represent the information that you got. And that is something that as an anthropologist I'm constantly concerned with. And I, I understand from my work and, and from the fundamental definition of disasters, that the fundamental definition of disasters is that a hurricane is not a disaster. A disaster is the intersection of a historically created condition of vulnerability that enhances the socially dis disruptive and materially destructive capacities of geophysical phenomena. Therefore, a disaster occurs at the intersection of what we sometimes call nature and society. And so it's not just a hurricane. The hurricane is just a hazard. The disaster is how, for example, the history of urbanization, but not just urbanization, the history of race relations, the history of gender relations, sometimes the history of capitalism come into articulation with something like a hurricane. And because 
disasters are this combination of society and nature, society is comprised of socially created lines of difference and sometimes inequity. Difference along lines of ethnicity, difference along lines of social class, different, uh, difference along lines of gender, difference along lines of sexual preference. In terms of who suffers how, who lives and who dies, uh, who gets to recover faster, who suffers what kind of trauma as a result of it. So that, by necessity, the research, that, the data that we gather tells us that we collect many voices, and those voices don't always agree with each other uh, in the aftermath of a catastrophe. If you ask someone, what was your experience of the disaster? What was your experience of the recovery? There, there will not be one narrative that emerges. And that's why in anthropology we might call multi or polyvocalia, the fact that there's multiple voices. So, so what I'm trying, the picture that I'm trying to give you of Houston in the aftermath of catastrophe, imagine if each one of you were to tell your own story of your life right now in the, in the same tone of voice and the same loudness that I'm saying it, and you all spoke at the same time, right? And that would be the cacophony, right? Many voices speaking, not, not necessarily always agreeing with one another. Some of them articulating very different experiences. Some of you might be saying, well, that's a truism, Roberto. Of course we know that. Of course we know everybody's story is the same. Yeah, it, it might be a truism at times, but when we actually see the world in practice, we, we forget these supposedly self-evident truths. And actually, they're not self-evident truths. They're, they're, they're actually truths or it's actually knowledge that is produced through the ethnographic pro process. So as an example, I want to share with you uh, a little quote that I have up here. This quote comes from the 10th anniversary uh, of Hurricane Katrina in New Orleans and its aftermath, and President Barack Obama was invited to the Lower Ninth Ward to give a speech. Uh, so my, my first disclaimer here is that I, I'm a Barack Obama fanboy. You know, <laughs> you know, there, there's no, so I'm not trying to take a pot shot here uh, at a wonderful president who I do, really do respect. The guy was a professional, consummate professional, no single scandal in his history, makes you long for <laughs> more innocent days, right? I, I'm not saying Mr. President Obama was perfect. Uh, I didn't necessarily agree with every decision that he made, but I certainly respected him. So the quote is up here not to take down President Obama, but just to point that even President Obama is part of certain cultural trends. And, and that cultural trend is this idea that there must be a narrative, that, that, the, that the recovery of New Orleans must be summarized under one story in the aftermath of a catastrophe. And, and, but how is that story told? So when I was reading the excerpts of the speech that President Obama gave, I was, I really differed. You know, I, I, I love President Obama, but there are many occasions in which I have had serious differences with him, and that's fine. That's the beauty of America. You can disagree even with people that you like. And part of his speech said that New Orleans in the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina was a city where everyone, no matter who they are or what they look like or how much money they've got, has the opportunity to make it. And what troubled me about that is that I began doing research in New Orleans uh, immediately after the storm. My parents, my sister, my cousins, my entire maternal family lived in New Orleans when they flooded. Uh, my cousin had to be rescued after a whole week uh, of wading through chest deep water. Uh, my mother's uh, house flooded and had to be gutted and completely reconstructed. And my parents spent six months in this wonderful city of Houston. Um, before they could go back, but I, the, my first entry into the field uh, to do research in Houston was to help my parents go, and to help my father and my sister go gut the house uh, in early October once the city was finally open after five weeks from the flood. And from 2005 to the present, I continue to go to New Orleans every year and follow up with people whom I have met through this research that I've been doing, people that I otherwise would never have had a reason to meet uh, and to get to know their lives. And the stories, the narratives that I collected through my work in New Orleans told me that I could not agree with the representation of New Orleans post-Katrina and its recovery that President Obama was presenting. That residents of the very lower ninth ward where I had been conducting research since 2006, their, their narratives did not agree with the narrative that President Obama was presenting about Hurricane Katrina. So I give you the narrative of one of my key interlocutors who was a gentleman called Warren Mac McClendon. Uh, Mr. McClendon passed away a couple of years ago. Uh, he had a very difficult life in the aftermath of Katrina. Uh, his daughter died during childbirth, and if you uh, look at health statistics, uh, mortality of African American women uh, during childbirth is much higher than people who self-identify as white in the United States because of health disparities in this country. Uh, so his daughter died in the aftermath of Katrina also giving childbirth. Uh, he decided to become deeply involved in community organizing, trying to help his community recover in the aftermath of the catastrophe, and made huge sacrifices in terms of his own finances uh, to build a community center. And this, is, this was the narrative that Mr. McClendon gave me uh, when I interviewed him. 
not in 2015, but in 2013, two years before President Obama visited the Lower Ninth Ward, he said, in 10 years, only a very small minority of the residents will be pre-Katrina Lower Niners in the Lower Ninth Ward. Next month will be eight years. We got less than one-third of my community back. That is not acceptable. This community had the highest home ownership in the state. We are treating them like they broke the levees, and we gave them a one-way ticket out. The Lower Ninth Ward was the hardest hit and the slowest to come back. I think it hasn't been done because of greed. In 10 years, it's going to be 5% of the people of this neighborhood. When you talk about gentrification, I can't imagine another community in a nation where this would happen. It's inhumane you are allowing this to happen. So that stands in direct contrast to, to the words of, of the president, right? And so the, the reason that I wanted to bring this up was because also uh, in that year, I had to go to the Society for Applied Anthropology annual meeting. And it is the Society for Applied Anthropology annual meeting. There's a, a, a whole gathering of disaster anthropologists from all over the world and also of people who are practitioners, who are not anthropologists, but who work for organizations like FEMA, and we all come together to share experiences and our knowledge in panels. And on that particular year, a very well-known disaster anthropologist who works in Haiti, uh, a, a professor known as Mark Schuller, was going to receive a prestigious Malinowski Award by the organization. So we were all very happy for him, and the whole society was waiting outside of this major hallway, uh, this major hall room, a banquet room, to go hear him talk uh, and, and see him receive his award. And when I was outside waiting for us to be allowed in, uh, I had the opportunity to catch up with a person who I had met in my research in New Orleans. And this person is a world-renowned uh, person who, who works with FEMA and has worked on different recovery plans. Um, and it's a high-level person, consultant, uh, anthropologist. Um, and we began to talk about my work in New Orleans. And because we had met in New Orleans when she was doing her own um, evaluation there of United Way and of different nonprofits, uh, she asked me, she said, I haven't been to New Orleans in a long time. Uh, how do you think that the city's doing? And my response to her was, well, we have to understand the multivocality of disaster. I can't come up with one narrative. What, I, what, what you have to do is understand the diverse narratives. And it depends who you are in the city, how you're socially positioned. Uh, how, what kind of narrative and how you can answer that question. Because the city isn't one thing. And a city like Houston, as we'll see, is experienced very differently, right? The, the city might be one land mass or one mass of, of architectural construction, but what is a space of comfort for some might be a space of terror for others. For example, I realized that in, in New Orleans. In New Orleans, for example, there was a lot of unabashed racial profiling on the part of the Jefferson Parish Police Department. And for, for many suburbanites, Suburbs like Kenner were considered spaces of comfort uh, and of delight. But when I work with people who lived in the Lower Ninth Ward who self-identify as African Americans, for them the suburbs were a space of terror. There, there were spaces that, that they feared walking through the streets because they knew that they would be harassed by police. Right? So, so uh, uh, this one city can have many different ways of people experiencing it. So, so I wanted to impress this upon my, my colleague. I, I said, well, it, it depend, my answer was, well, it depends who you ask. Right? If, if you ask a real estate investor from California, Hurricane Katrina was a godsend because now they have access and they can buy out all kinds of properties and, and flip them and make lots of capital. And indeed, like President Obama said, for them, the, the city is a wonderful place and the recovery is very successful. But if you are someone like Ward Mac McClendon, the community is not doing very well. Well, my colleague's response was, well, that's a load of... <laughs> she said it, I did right? Uh, so, so it points again to, to this fact that, that I try to give this coherent answer about the multivocality of disasters, and it was quickly dismissed. Uh, and, and that's why I have continued to reflect on it, because my question is, and my purpose as an anthropologist is here not to judge President Obama and not to judge my colleague, but to understand why do we have this cultural expectation that there has to be only one narrative, one singular narrative through which we speak about recovery. And, and how do we deal with the multivocality, right? In, in a nation that is so diverse, and as we're seeing today with movements like Black Lives Matter, uh, it's the fact that, that there are dramatically different ways of experiencing the same society, right? And, and, and that we have to take the diversity of these voices seriously uh, because some of them have very good reasons for existing. So let's look at Houston then, because you have been talking a lot and I haven't gotten to Houston, you're probably wondering, oh my God, is he gonna ever get to talk about Houston? So here's an example of what I would call the, the hegemonic narrative, just like President Obama had this hegemonic narrative that's saying everything's great in New Orleans, it's a land of opportunity, and if you can't get ahead, it's your own fault because the color of your skin, the social class that you come from, how you speak, none of those things matter. New Orleans is this great place of opportunity right now, and if you haven't gotten ahead, it's your own fault. 
let, let's look at Houston. Let's look at a narrative. So we can go to the website uh, of the city of Houston, and we can see one of these narratives. And it's a narrative uh, of Mayor Sylvester Turner's office. And this is what he says. He says, our city has experienced historic devastation with Hurricane Harvey, but it has also shown us the best in humanity. Throughout Houston history, we have faced challenges and built a city that is even better and more resilient. This time is no different. Working together, neighbor helping neighbor, Houston will emerge better than it was before. And for me, that's a challenge. For me, I am not going to accept Mayor Turner's narrative at face value. I'm going to use that as, as, as a hypothesis to test. Is Houston really emerging better? What do we call the better? Who gets to call, who gets to decide what the better is, right? Which is also a big conflict or a big source of tension and, and, and contestation within disaster anthropology. We always talk about rebuilding better, but better for whom, right? In, in the city of New Orleans, rebuilding better for some people meant that public housing that was meant to house the working poor of New Orleans, who were predominantly, if not 100% African-American, working poor people. These, these were the people who got hand-me-downs. These were the people who worked, who flipped the burgers, who cleaned the bathtubs, who cleaned the bathrooms, who, who washed the dishes for the tourism industry, and who weren't paid a living wage, who had to then rely also on support of... It wasn't the workers that relied on support of the, of the federal government. It was the very wealthy hotel and tourism industry that relies on the federal government to, to subsidize the, 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 live, the lifestyle of their workers, and it's not a great lifestyle. And the city of New Orleans, uh, the Housing, Housing Authority of New Orleans and HUD decided to arbitrarily close the four major, the first four public housing developments built in the United States. And as a result, 111,000 African Americans could not come back to their city. Right? Um, and what about their voices, right? And, and some people call that the better. But other people in the city of New Orleans said that it's not better, right? That's, that's ethnocide. You're, you're, you're purposely targeting an entire culture. So as, as Dr. McNeil said, I, we got this grant. And this, this grant was this, this time to answer the question, what does Hurricane Harvey reveal for whom? And the, the importance of that question is because people, anthropologists have often called disasters revelatory crises, meaning that, that the disaster itself makes you see things that you wouldn't previously see, that the kinds of contradictions and inequities um, that, that give disasters their form and magnitude in the social practices that on a day-to-day -day basis we cannot see how unsustainable they are, that the unsustainability of certain land use practices or practices of making social inequity all of a sudden come to the foreground. So some people argue that for many folks Katrina really brought to the foreground in an undeniable way con conditions of socioeconomic class-based and race-based inequity in the United States. Uh, friends of mine who work in the Caribbean said, when I saw images of New Orleans, it looked like Haiti. And the idea that, that Haiti couldn't possibly be here, right? But that Haiti is here, and Haiti was here in places like the, the Lower Ninth Ward. Uh, so, that, so that's what anthropologists have, have meant, that the disaster all of a sudden helps you see, see things that you accept as part of everyday life, and you don't necessarily under, recognize how unsustainable they are or their social impacts. But one of the problems that I had with this statement is that for anthropologists um, who, who understand disasters as these historical processes of the engagement of society and nature, they, they behold the disaster from what we call a political ecological perspective, which to me does help you understand why a hazard becomes a disaster when combined with society. But the, but the, but the key thing for me is that the majority of the public is not anthropologically trained. So the question might be, certainly for an anthropologist, a disaster will reveal the political ecology of the disaster itself, but what about the general public? Uh, how, how does the general public interpret in the disaster, particularly with the diversity of people in the city of Houston, where you have people who work white-collar jobs, who are highly trained as engineers, who work for energy companies, uh, or you also have low-level service sector workers uh, who live in dramatically different parts of the city, ex exposed to very different things, right? Some people in the city have to deal with very high levels of benzene poisoning and exposure to chemicals. People who live in, the, in regions of the city like Pasadena and Manchester and East Houston, whereas you have other parts of Houston like West Houston and the Energy Corridor, uh, where people do not necessarily have to deal with those ex the exposure levels in those ways, right? Um, and, and also, uh, so again, I, I was curious, in, in, in the differences in terms of ethnicity and race and class, what, what are a variety of ways in which Houstonians are going to interpret, and what, what will Harvey reveal for them? So look, and asking these questions engages what are really central in, in big questions of anthropology. I'm not going to get too much into them, but I just wanted you to, to know that this relates to really big questions of anthropology. And one of the big questions of anthropology that it relates to, or of the social sciences in general, 
a cultural work of a German sociologist called Ulrich Beck, who wrote a book that uh, was published in 1986 called Risk Society Towards a New Modernity. And in Risk Society, Ulrich Beck made, made this case that, that we have this thing called industrialization, and we have this thing that we call modern societies. And under those modern societies are usually uh, Western capitalists, but also sometimes socialist or communist societies uh, that are industrialized, that have heavy, heavy production. Um, and in those societies, in the earlier stage of modernity, let's say in the mid-1950s, so these societies were, predom predom in particular from the 19th century to maybe the 1950s, these societies were predominantly concerned with the distribution of scarcity. Who, get, who, gets to get, who gets to eat? Who gets to get paid? Who gets paid? Who does it? That was a major concern of these societies. But Beck argues that beginning post the 1950s, the, uh, these societies, people in these societies, policymakers, leading citizens begin to be concerned with other things. The fact that industrialization, technological development, all of a sudden, we, if you go back to the 1950s, you know, one, of, one of the examples I was showing to my students this time in class, this, this, this week in class was, when we first developed nuclear weapons in the Manhattan Project, the, 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 the physicists who worked on the project had no way of knowing about radioactive fallout. And nuclear energy was celebrated as the best thing that ever, had ever come to humanity. Nuclear weapons were supposed to solve the problem of violence because they were supposed to guarantee peace through mutually assured destruction. So nuclear weapons work as long as they don't explode, right? That's how they're supposed to work. They're, they're not supposed to blow up. Uh, and they were highly celebrated, right? But, but and, and here's the other interesting thing about nuclear weapons. Uh, we, we all know that we won the Cold War, right? The United States won the Cold War, Diego Reagan, all that good stuff. We won the Cold War, but we nuked ourselves about 300 times. There, there were over 300 open air nuclear weapon tests done all over in Nevada. And uh, if, you, if you go to the book written by anthropologist Joseph Masco, uh, who has a map by the, the physicists of the Manhattan Project that, that shows where their radiation went, and the, the fallout went everywhere, not just within the continental United States, but up to Siberia. It went around the world. Uh, so yeah, well, yay for us, right? But, but that's the point of the risk society. The, the, the risk society is how, in the second half of the 20th century, Political leaders begin to realize, like, oh, all these things we celebrated, like we celebrated com internal combustion engines, but then we realize CO2 emissions create cl climate change, right? Or anthropogenic climate change. And we celebrated nuclear energy, but then we realize, oh my God, uh, nuclear energy actually has a thing called radioactive fallout, right? And we celebrate industrialization and coal, but and now we're dealing again with, with the effects of climate change, right? So, real society becomes the, the, the one moment of, of awareness when these project policies of modernization, development, and industrialization begin to engender risks that weren't there before. And then, according to Beck, the concern of the risk society becomes not so much a distribution of scarcity, we're, we, although we're still concerned with scarcity, for example, who gets paid what in the United States? Should we raise minimum wage? But most importantly, people become concerned with how do we distribute risk? How do we distribute who is exposed to what? And we see that here in Houston, right? Who gets to live in Pasadena? Uh, if you go to the neighborhood of Manchester, the Valero refinery is right next door to houses where people live. And when the refinery is working, benzene rains upon people, and benzene is hardly carcinogenic. Right? And the, the levels of childhood leukemia are through the roof in these neighborhoods. Who gets exposed to that, right? So uh, Whole Foods is also an example, right? So, so in, the, in the early form of modernity in the United States, we were all happy that we would, that we would have I live in the north or the Midwest, so we have schnooks. I don't know what the big supermarkets are here. I think you have schnooks too, no? At Kroger, right? So you go to Kroger, right? That's a distribution of scarcity. Who, who can afford to buy a Kroger? But now we have Whole Foods, because Whole Foods is more concerned with the risk of things like agricultural pesticides, right? So now we're much more concerned with not so much that we can actually buy food, but that we can buy what kind of food that's been exposed to what? And that's the risk society, right? That we, be, that we begin to have other kinds of concerns. And one of the things that Ulrich Beck hoped for is that Beck said, because toxins don't, don't respect national borders, just like radiation went all over the world from, from our great open air nuclear experiments, um, then these risks go, go everywhere and affect everyone. Um, just like people talked about Harvey being an equal opportunity disaster, right? An equal opportunity flood. So the, the hope that Beck had was that because the, the, the effects of industrialization were going to affect people across national borders, that a new form of what he called cosmopolitanism would emerge, where, where people of dramatically different nationalities, so dramatically different social classes, dramatically different so, race and ethnic groups, would, would have to band together. They would have a reason to come together to form unities to, that, that are necessary to address the challenges of the risk society. And that, so, so he was hopefully hypothesizing. He was hypothesizing that, oh, there were all these deleterious things 
about the rich society and about industrialization, that hopefully that would lead to the emergence of new forms of solidarities uh, that he called cosmopolitan solidarities that would, that would help fight back, fight back against climate change, for example. But that's a hypothesis. What I want to argue is that Houston provides us for a, a great context in which to not accept Beck's hopeful hypotheses as truth, but to hold them to the test in the, in the same way that we can hold Mayor Sylvester's representation and narrative about Harvey to the test. So this is what we've done. This is how we, we've done it. Method. Anthropology is an empirical profession. That means that we don't just sit in comfy chairs and come up with things. We actually go out into the world, talk to people, share their experiences, do things alongside them, record interviews with them, uh, write field note entries, uh, and try to represent the world for them. We also understand that Houston is a very complex and diverse city. Uh, so we wanted to make sure that we got a little bit of the, the great diversity of the city of Houston. We haven't been able to get all of the sectors of Houstonian society, but I'm hoping this is a long-term project and we can capture a lot more. We, we use demographic maps that are available online that, that help you understand that in some parts of the city of Houston, that people make a lot more money than others. Uh, in some parts of, of Houston, people might have a median household income of $300,000. In other parts of Houston, people might have a median household income of $50,000. Uh, in, in some parts of Houston, there might be a greater percentage of people who self-identify as African-American who live in that area than in others. And there, in other parts of Houston, there might be more people who self-identify as white uh, than others. In, so, in some parts of Houston, there are also enclave communities uh, of immigrant groups. Uh, and so we wanted to get a sense of understanding the socioeconomic demographic layout of Houston and also understanding where flooding took place uh, so that we could target specifically uh, those, those communities and those places and try to get as many as many diverse voices as possible. Uh, and I call this purpose of snowball sampling, how we conducted it. And I told you a little bit about the dates uh, during which we conducted our work. And we went out into the, to the neighborhoods, uh, and we used especially um, the Super Neighborhood Alliance and civil society leaders as our entry point into, many, into these communities. And I'm going to talk today a little bit about West Houston, about East Houston, particularly the North Forest uh, neighborhood of East Houston, Manchester, and East 10 Second Ward where we conducted our work. Uh, I was lucky to count with the assistance of this research project with, of two students from the University of Houston, Maya Sierra and Irene Martinez, and Grace Vargas from Southern Illinois University, Carbondale, who also had a great time working here this summer. And the important thing to point out is that just as my research in post-Katrina New Orleans helped me come to understand New Orleans in, in ways that I, and come to know New Orleans in ways that I didn't, also for Irene and Mayra, although they are lifelong Houstonians, um, they had never been to some of the neighborhoods of Houston. They had never been to East Houston. And, and their minds were absolutely blown by the fact that they live within the same city uh, as, East, as, as the Houstonians of East Houston, yet they had never experienced what these people had lived through. They, they had never experienced having to have their school district closed arbitrarily by the state legislature. They have not had to experience living next to Superfund sites. They have not had to experience living next to industrial sites. Uh, they, they have not necessarily experienced environmental injustice in the way that the residents of East Houston have lived. So again, that's the importance of ethnography. That's what ethnography brings, I think, to the table as well. Uh, so I want to tell you a little bit about the different voices. And we're going to be going back to this map to get a sense of where we're at. Uh, civil society leaders, uh, well, the thing about the Super Neighborhood Alliance is that it represents people from all parts of the city in general. And I just wanted to share a little bit with you about the narratives that civil society leaders have. Uh, all the names that I'm using today are pseudonyms to protect the privacy uh, of, of the people who share their trust with us. Uh, so Janice Brooks is a lifelong resident of the city of Houston. She comes from a rather affluent family. A lot of these civil society, the overwhelming majority of the civil society leaders who we interact with are college educated, self-identify as white, although there are folks who self-identify as African American, but the, major, the great majority of them are people who self-identify as white, college educated, and are pretty affluent. And the narrative that comes out of Janice Brooks uh, is very different from the one of Mayor Turner. Mayor Turner is saying that we're going to rebuild better. But this is what Janice Brooks uh, has to say about Hurricane Harvey. She says, much of the flooding during Harvey and tax day happened outside the designated floodplain. Our storm drain system and our development standards have not kept up. Our storm drain system does not function like it is represented. The, Corps, the Army Corps of Engineers releases the flood maps so the maps are politicized. And what she's trying to point out is that, uh, and this is one of the key contrib contributions that, that she is making and that many of the civil society leaders are making, is that Hurricane Harvey was by no means a natural disaster, and the city of Houston, it, Harvey was not the disaster. It is the development of the city of Houston that is the disaster. Um, the, the city of Houston the, the floods by design, 
and the practices of real estate development and urban growth that are taking place are what are creating the disaster. And most importantly, uh, I've been interviewing Janice uh, since January 2018, and I last interviewed her in January 2019, and her assessment is completely contrary to what Mayor Turner is saying. She is saying the, the policies that have been put in place in the aftermath of Harvey to regulate development within the floodplain are actually going to make things worse. So in the aftermath of, of, of Harvey, there was a great push by Mayor Sylvester's office to create the illusion, create, create the, the appearance that the city of Houston is getting tough on real estate development. Um, and, and, and part of the issue that, that Janice is trying to point out, and the, the thing about Janice to understand is that this is an ext a person who, she, she's actually a trained archaeologist. She doesn't work in this university, but it's interesting that she does have an anthropological background, but, but, but she thinks like an anthropologist would think about a disaster. She, she, she views a disaster from a political, ecological perspective and understands very well why, why hurricanes like Harvey become disasters in Houston. And one of the issues in Houston that, that, that occurs is that um, real estate developers, construction companies make massive campaign contributions to political campaigns, especially to the mayor's office. When the mayor gets elected, it is the mayor that appoints the city planning commission. And the city planning commission is the one who is supposed to enforce the codes for construction within the floodplain to make sure that, that, top, uh, that, that, that surface runoff and, and the, hydro the hydrology of the region isn't heavily affected to the point that it creates a flood. But when the mayor appoints these people, then the people who make campaign contributions, if, if they want to have a, a, a condo development, but they feel that it's going to cost too much for them to uphold the code because the code might require them to devote a certain amount of their, the land that they're going to develop for water detention or water retention facilities. And they might say, well, what if I could only get away with only putting in half the water detention facilities? Then they'll appeal the code to the City Planning Commission, and the City Planning Commission will allow them to get away with it. But then what they're, what they're doing is that they're increasing flood risk for everybody else because they're not properly dealing with the, with the surface runoff that they're not properly managing. So in the aftermath of, of the disaster, Mayor Sylvester Turner's office made a big push to revise what is called the Chapter 19 uh, of, the, of the floodplain development guidelines uh, of, the city, of the city charter. But what, what, what the, the first thing to keep in mind is that from the ethnography that we've done, city officials have themselves said that even with the existing codes, the city does not count with sufficient personnel to enforce the code. So no matter what rules are in the books, we can't even enforce them. So real estate developers can pretty much play, play a gamble of saying, I'm not going to build up to code, and I might be creating flood risk for other people, but I'll take the gamble that I won't get busted. And if I do get busted, maybe I'll call my friends in City Hall. Um, and so the codes can't even be enforced. And the, and the, code, the, the modifications that were passed in Chapter 19 are, you think of the floodplain as your bathtub, right? And, and think about, you know, you all know about Archimedes, the guy who ran around yelling Eureka, right, when he discovered the principles of buoyancy, right? So think about, you, you fill up your bathtub to the brim, right? It's, it's to the brim. And then, uh, you know, I'm pretty hefty, I'm like 190 pounds, I think I'm like 30 pounds overweight. If I go into your tub, what's going to happen? It's going to overfill, right? That's how the floodplain works. If you bring in more fill, more material into the floodplain, it's going to be like your bathtub. When it fills to the brim, it's going to spill over. And that's why during Harvey, 75% of the 200,000 structures that flooded were outside the 100-year floodplain. Because we put so much fill and so much construction material within the floodplain that the water has to go elsewhere. So the Army Corps of Engineers maps don't mean anything. So, so a lot of people in Houston didn't have flood insurance because they, they assumed they didn't live within the floodplain. But the floodplain no longer predicts in Houston where it's going to flood. In the, in the majority of the structures that flooded were outside the 100-year flood. Um, and, and the policies that have been passed by, by Sylvester uh, Turner's uh, administration, uh, number one, are, they did not ban the possibility of bringing in new fill. They said no net fill, but the problem is that no net fill means that the real estate developers will probably bring in fill or, or eventually will bring in more fill uh, than necessary for a variety of reasons that we don't have time to get into right now, and we don't have enough. The, the city of Houston does not count with the staff to enforce that. We, there is no way of knowing. Uh, so, so, so Jan Janice Brooks in 2019 was, was not very optimistic about the outlook. That, that No, we didn't learn our lesson. Uh, and actually, we doubled down on the development practices that, that created harm, and that's where we're at. Um, moving on, I know that I'm not supposed to talk for too long. But, but thinking about these different narratives, right? Because uh, who here knows Leo Limbeck III? 
Yeah, one. This is the first thing you should know. So Leo Lindbergh the third is uh, uh, he is um, an adjunct professor in the College of Business at Rice University. He is also the CEO of Aquinas Companies, which is a, a major limited liability company that, that is involved in construction and real estate development. In the aftermath of Hurricane Harvey, Leo Limbeck III wrote an editorial to the Houston Chronicle where he said, Hurricane Harvey was not a disaster. Please, people, understand, you all need to understand, only 0.00002% of the Houston population died. The city only lost 10% of its annual income. It was not a disaster. As a matter of fact, Harvey was a, was a certification. It was proof positive. What Harvey revealed, according to Leo Lindbeck III, what Harvey revealed is that our, our free market and deregulated approach towards, towards urban development works. And the real risk here is not that Houstonians might flood and die. The real risk here is that y'all are going to get weak in the knees. You all ever see, I think it was in 2004 in the Republican National Convention, Arnold Schwarzenegger gave a speech. And he was talking about fiscal deregulation. And he said, don't be economic girly men. You, you ever see that? No, it's, it's a great clip. It's funny. I should play it. Um, and as an anthropologist, I should know better than to mock someone's accent because that's, it's kind of racism. You shouldn't. But, but I think Arnold, we can get away with doing that to Arnold. And, and, and so and, and that's what Leo Limbeck III is saying. Don't be economic girly people. Right? Like, don't get weak in the knees now, people. Now is the time to start questioning the stuff we've been doing. You know, let's not look the other way, right? Amazing, fascinating, these narratives, right? The variety, the variety of these narratives. Uh, now let's go to West Houston. And I know I'm running out of time and I always talk too long, but I think we'll go to 5.20, right? So can I go like nine more minutes? And sure. we'll be good? Yeah. So, so I wanted to give you a, a little bit of the, the, the voices that have been coming in from our ethnography. This is a taste, a sample of the words that we've been getting. Hopefully this will be a book soon and you can actually get to know these people better. But one of the stories that I want to share with you about West Houston of our interlocutors is a person whose name, I'm going to change her name to Fran. Fran is amazing, an amazing human being. Um, I don't agree with everything she does. I don't agree with her politics at times, but, but I am in awe of Fran. Fran is about 70 years old. Uh, she's a cancer survivor. Uh, she's also a survivor of several emotionally abusive relationships with her male partners. Um, she lives by herself now. Uh, the cancer that she had was in her spine and required lots of radiation and she ended up developing diabetes from that, so she has a lot of health issues. On the morning of Harvey, there was a, a leak in her kitchen and she slipped on the floor and she didn't know at the time but she fractured her spine. So she spent Harvey with a, with a fractured spine. Her daughter is a firefighter and when it was time to, when the, when the house began to flood, her daughter came and helped her with a broken back move all her antique furniture to the second floor of her house. Now, she lives in, in one of these multi-million dollar subdivisions, and she's a person that, had I not actually had the reason to be an ethnographer and visit her, I probably would have judged her. I would have, ju I would have judged her. As a matter of fact, on the day that we were going to conduct our first interview with her, I was already judging her. I was like, oh my God, these rich people, right? Living in the floodplain. She probably voted for Trump. God, I don't want to, I don't, you know, I don't know if I want to talk to this person, right? And, and so, there we go. And, and it, we proceeded to have a 10-hour ethnographic interview with her. My, my eth undergraduate research assistant, Grace Vargas, her eyes, I saw pain in her eyes because, because Fran would not stop talking but, but telling us <laughs> these amazing stories and giving us all this background about herself. She, she fractured her spine. She was evacuated in a boat. And the, the thing about Fran is that um, she, she really holds herself accountable because she did not live within a designated floodplain. She lives next to Attics and Barker Reservoirs, and most of you probably know the story of these two reservoirs that were built after a series of very catastrophic floods in 1937 in Houston. At that time, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, when, at that time, there, all these subdivisions, West Houston didn't exist. This was all farmland, ranches. The Army Corps of Engineers, the thing about the Army Corps of Engineers that, that, that you had to, that, that I feel, the way that I understand them is, they are highly professional people, but the Army Corps of Engineers doesn't get to decide policy. The Army Corps of Engineers does what the federal government and what Congress gives them money for in the orders that they give them. So sometimes the Army Corps of Engineers does things that are highly questionable by the public, but we have to understand that they're following orders. They're, they're, they follow a military structure. They don't get to decide policy. And I have known and interviewed many engineers who work for the Army Corps of Engineers who are very, know, very knowledgeable people and are generally well-intended people, but they have to follow orders. And if the funding is not there, and if, and, if, and if we don't pay our taxes, or if we pay our taxes and we choose that we'd rather have those tax dollars spent in doing things like invading Iraq and Afghanistan, rather than building levees and things like that, then ugly things happen. Uh, so so the, when the Army Corps of Engineers built these, 
reservoirs, they didn't have the resource, the funding to buy all the land that would have to be designated sacrifice zones. That is outside of the floodplain, but that in the case of severe rainfall, uh, that precipitation that threatened to actually destroy the dams and create really catastrophic flooding that would end in the tremendous loss of human life, they would have to flood search and sacrifice zones. And these sacrifice zones were designated within plans of the Army Corps of Engineers. Now, as the city of Houston grew, no one was supposed to live within these areas. Or if anyone lived within these areas, they were supposed to know that they lived within these areas and therefore buy things like flood insurance and also put their homes at a proper elevation so that if the water had to be released, that they wouldn't go underwater. The real estate developers who built these subdivisions put it in the small print and did not tell the people who bought the houses that they were within a sacrifice zone. I hold the real estate developers, like Mr. Leo Lindbeck III, accountable. Uh, real estate development companies like Picarello, uh, also the, the current resilience are, uh, of, of, of the city of Houston, um, is, was, has also been involved in these programs, right? Who's, who's supposed to be the person who's overseeing resilience right now. Um, so, so uh, her house flooded. And the, and the thing that I flooded is that she lives in a multi-million dollar home, but we have to understand that she is financially maxed out. Right? She's not extremely wealthy. She just bought the, big, the best house that she could buy with her money, which may not have been a good decision in the long run, but I'm not here to judge her. Uh, and the thing that she, did, that she judges herself for is the fact that, that she had the papers. You know, she was not told to buy flood insurance. She was not encouraged to buy flood insurance, which I think is criminally negligent, if not just flat out criminal, on the part of the real estate developers. Uh, and, but she had thought about buying flood insurance, and she had the papers on top of her table when the house flooded and now she's flooded without insurance, right? And, and what's really fascinating about us is that this is what is traumatic for her, and it's about how things like gender and flooding become intimately intertwined. What is traumatic for her is not so much that her house flooded, although that is heavily traumatic, but what is most traumatic for her is that in the history of her abusive relationships with her male partners, every time that she tried to walk away from them, they would tell her things like, you're not going to survive out there on your own. You can't even balance your own checkbook. You know, you're just a woman. You know, I'm a powerful man, leader, captain of industry. And, and for her, that is what is traumatic. For, for her, what is traumatic is that the voice of her ex-husband always comes back when she realizes that she made one bad decision. Uh, and one of, one of the, the things that she said during the narrative while we were interviewing is that she said, I wish the end of the world would come because if the world ended, I wouldn't have to make more decisions and, and I wouldn't have to deal with the trauma of being wrong again, right? And of course, we all make mistakes, right? But, it, but it's about how her own history of gender-based abuse kind of gets wrapped up uh, with the flooding. So that's kind of what's going on in Houston. Another example of the narratives that are coming through of Houston is, this is an interview that we just did Saturday. It was fantastic. Uh, me and Grace got to interview three engineers who are not part of the Army Corps of Engineers. They're engineers who also bought houses within the, 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 the sacrifice zones. Um, one of them I will call Sal. Uh, Sal. Um, what, what, what fascinated me about Sal is that this guy's an electrical engineer. As far as I'm concerned, electrical engineering is one of the most demanding forms of engineering, right? You've got to be really smart to get a degree like that. I, you know, I, 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 I wanted to be an engineer when I was an undergrad, and, and I could have been a mechanical engineer, but I thought social, so, social anthropology was more interesting. But my best friend from high school went on to become an electrical engineer and now makes like $300,000 working for, for Chevron, and you know, is pretty wealthy and pretty affluent. And, and these are very smart people who have very poor, what I would call, flood risk literacy. So, so Sal, uh, during the interview, ju just like Fran, when, when I asked Fran, you know, so who do you think is responsible for the flooding? And Fran said, well, it's, it's a federal government. And I disagree with her. I, I, think, it's, I, I think it's the real estate developers. Uh, the, the Army Corps of Engineers told the developers, you're building within a sacrifice zone. And then the developers said, yeah, yeah, we'll put it in a small print. But who reads small print? How, how many of you have ever taken out a credit card? Yeah? Did you read the whole little contract? Did you read all the small print? Nobody does. And if you read it, will you even understand it? Right? Right. So, um, so, so Fran, and that, that, I, I love Fran, but, but she holds the, the Army Corps of, Army Corps of Engineers responsible. And, and for me, you know, that's, that, that is not necessarily having flood risk literacy. Under, understanding the history of how your area came to be flood prone, uh, and ultimately understanding also the, 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 the questions of responsibility and accountability. And, and for, for Sal also, Sal, uh, uh, very wonderful, these are all wonderful, amazing people, uh, a very smart person, but again, uh, 
when he was narrating, when I asked him this question, why did Hurricane Harvey become a disaster, he, whereas Janice Brooks wants to talk about the pol politics, right? That, that, and I agree with Janice that in Houston, flooding is primarily a political problem. It's not that we don't know how to prevent flooding. And it's not that the resources don't exist to help minimize flooding. It's a matter of political will, right? So, so the, the, the fundamental problem of flooding is a political problem uh, in Houston, not necessarily a te technological one. But, but, but Sal, who is a trained electrical engineer, who owns a $4 million home, and it's fantastic, right? And again, the difference is in how gender factors into trauma. For, for Fran, what is traumatic for her is the voice of her ex-husband come into her mind when she thinks that she made a mistake. Sal jokingly told me that the trauma for him and Harvey was watching his Porsche Carrera go underwater. Which was insured. He's getting another one. And his five series Beamer, right? They went under. It was, it was traumatic for him, right? He's a great guy. Fantastic, hilarious. But, 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 but from his perspective, the problem of flooding is not political. He holds the Army Corps of Engineers accountable for, for not being up to date with the proper technology. And he was claiming that through all kinds of sensing mechanisms and that, that, that they could have known and whether, whether the, the dams were going to burst and how much water to let out. Um, but, but I disagree with him. And, and I think that although he might be a highly competent person, he really doesn't have the proper flood literacy. And keeping in mind that also blaming the Army Corps of Engineers, the Army Corps of Engineers can only do what they have money for in their budget, which is allocated by Congress. The same thing happened in New Orleans during Hurricane Katrina. The, the levy system of eastern New Orleans were, was egregiously, horribly under-maintained because we can get really excited about bombing the bejesus out of Iraq, but nobody gets excited about funding education and flood risk reduction in the United States. Like, if, if, someone, if someone wins a political campaign for president on that platform, let me know. Because I don't think anyone's pro proposed it, right? And, and that's one of the things that happened in New Orleans. It's the fact that the Army Corps of Engineers knew how deficient this levy system was. Congress had simply not allocated the funding. Again, flood risk is at heart a political problem, not a technological one. Um, so that, let's go out of East Houston, West Houston, but let's go really quick to East Houston. Well, it was very fascinating to me about East Houston is, again, the diversity of voices. And I'll close it here because I think that we want to leave some time for talking, but I think you've gotten the gist of the, of the talk, right, of the presentation. But I think I really want to talk about East Houston. Um, and when I do research, I think the purpose of doing research is, is finding out what you didn't even know you didn't know. And, you know, I, I, I hate to think, you know, Donald Rumsfeld, right? I have a lot of objections to Donald Rumsfeld, but, but I, I like when he talked about Iraq when he said, uh, we have to figure out the unknown unknowns, like the things that we didn't know we didn't know. And that's like really deep, man. Like, like think about it. <laughs> there are things that you don't know, you don't even know, right? Yeah, and, and that's, what, that's the whole point of ethnographic field work. I mean, you write a proposal, you ask a question that almost assumes that you already know what you don't know, but what's really cool about ethnography and what's really cool about any kind of research is when you start figuring, like, realizing what you didn't know. That's when things get really exciting. And, and I think East Houston has been one of those places where, where some really interesting things have happened uh, over the course of this project. In, in the anthropology of disasters, as we were saying, you know, if you travel back in time to the early 20th century, uh, people did not have an anthropological or critically informed perspective on disasters. And disasters, we've all heard about the concept of acts of God, right? Or, or even the idea of natural disaster. The idea of natural disaster is the idea that we can't do anything about it. It comes from nature, right? I mean, all we can do is react to it. But in the 1970s, that's when critical geographers and sociologists and eventually anthropologists began to point out the fact that no, uh, there, there's nothing natural about disasters. If anything, you should call them socio-natural. Uh, or if anything, you should try to undo this binary between nature and culture and understand the relationship between human practice, human development, and the environment in the material world. So well, in Mexico, where I spent a lot of time doing research as well, you know, a lot of people often when, when have this, this critical narrative saying, you know, if, some, if, if somebody explains a disaster saying it was God's will, those people are just wrong, those people are just dumb, those people are just stupid, they're uninformed. But one of the things that was really fascinating about this research is that, as I was saying, the research question that we asked, the civil society leaders, are, they are like anthropologists, they think like anthropologists, they're, they're political ecologists in how they narrate the disaster. And for them, the research question that we asked made perfect sense. When we asked them, when, when, I, when I told Janice Brooks and, and her colleagues in the, civil, in the Super Neighborhood Association, uh, and I, said, and I started, started explaining my question, saying, you know, we anthropologists, we have this cockamamie idea that a hazard is not a disaster, and that you know, social practices and human development has a lot to do with, with how a disaster takes place. They, they, they picked that ball up and ran with it. Like, the, the question made perfect sense to them. In East Houston, with a lot of the working class, working poor, African-American residents we interviewed, that question didn't land as well. 
And that's not because they're not smart. That's not. You know, it, that's, that's simply because our, our question is making all kinds of assumptions about who's going to answer it. And when we were trying to press people to, to, to give us an answer to our question, why do you think Harvard became a disaster, many of the responses that we got were, it's God's will. And for, for many politically trained anthropologists, the answer would be, well, you're just wrong, right? Like, you, you're not correct. But, but, but that pressed me to begin to examine this question in, in a deeper sense. And, and we thought, well, if, if people are, in, and one of the things that people narrated as we interviewed them was the importance of their churches and the importance of their pastors. And, and what one particular interlocutor told us, you know, there's only three places you can find me. You can find me at my home, at my job, or you can find me at my church. And so as an ethnographer, I thought, well, we gotta go to the churches. We gotta talk to the pastors. We gotta see what's going on in the churches to try to understand what, why people are narrating it as God's will. And, and that led to a very interesting realization. On this side you have, the only person whose real name I will use is Mr. Albert Coleman. Mr. Albert, Albert Coleman is a paragon of civil society leadership. Uh, he, is, um, a per he was one of the first police officers to racially integrate the Houston Police Department in the late 1960s. Uh, he's a leader of his community. Uh, he's a super neighborhood alliance president. And when we began to interview him, and we were asking him this question, we want to talk about Harvey, and he didn't want to talk about Harvey, he wanted to talk about education. And a narrative that also came out of East Houston was, you know, although Harvey was a disaster, it wasn't as disastrous for us as the closing of our school district. The, the North Forest School District in East Houston was one of the last African-American controlled school districts in the state of Texas. It wasn't perfect, it, it had some flaws, but it wasn't, any less in its performance than uh, HISD. The, the suspicion of residents is that a school district, particularly one that's minority organized in an area that is very promising and, and potentially very lucrative real estate, keeps the community together. And the idea here is to disband this community, break it up, because we can put condos in there and, and make a lot of money. So the school district was closed. Uh, and, and that wrecked the middle class of, of this community, right? So there's all kinds of narratives about, African Amer about economically marginalized African-American communities in the United States, right? So people say things like, oh, those people just don't have a work ethic. Oh, those people don't value education. I, I've heard narratives such as, what happened to the leadership of the African-American community? Well, here it is, right? Here's a community where people actually voted in favor of a bond in 2009 to raise their own taxes to, to get their own campus of the Houston Community College within it. Uh, here, here's a community where people emphasize the importance of education and where the state of Texas has actually gone to great lengths to actually destroy that and, and, and to actually undermine their resilience. So, so one, as we began to go to, and so as part of our participant observation, we actually started going to, to Baptist churches in East Houston with permission of the pastors, of course, and of uh, the congregations. And, and we found, some, we found really, something really interesting that as an ethnographer, just because two things seem similar on the surface, this is something that the founder of anthropology pointed out in the Methods of Ethnology in 1911, that, that the thing about anthropology is that many things might look similar in the surface, it doesn't mean that they're the same thing. And just because someone says it's God's will, it doesn't mean that it means the same thing. And what God's will means in East Houston is that God's will is a narrative of resilience for East Houstonians. East Houstonians are people who have had to deal with the absolute arbitrariness of structural racism. And when you have to deal with racism that is so arbitrary, you need something to get you through. So one of the sermons that we went to, one of, one of the church services that we went to, the pastor was talking, the sermon was surrounded the, the, the particular story of walking through the shadow, through the valley of the shadow of death. And the whole, the whole message of walking through the valley of the shadow of death is the fact that there are certain things in life that are going to happen that are absolutely arbitrary, like structural racism, like the closing of your school district, like the flooding of Harvey, and you have to get through it. And that's what God's will means to these people, right? So, so it's fascinating, right? What, what seems on the surface at first to be irration, an irrational narrative actually makes a lot of sense once you understand the, the social positionality and social complexity. So that's kind of what I wanted to give you guys a sense of the kinds of stories, the kinds of narratives, the complexity of Houston. If that's more than I can keep on talking about, obviously I'm a bad time manager. There's a lot more that I can talk to you about, but hopefully the book will come out someday. You can read it if you're interested. Uh, and I think I'll leave it at that. Uh, so we have some time for interactions or questions if anyone's got. If anyone ha wants to talk about it, then. Yes. 
Rasmussen, right? Susan Rasmussen, right? Correct? Yes. yes. came out in, in post-Katrina New Orleans. Yes, I mean, those, those narratives came out in New Orleans, right? Uh, uh, be, be, because New Orleans is a, is a city with, 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 especially because uh, there's a very um, resilient LGBT community in New Orleans. I think some people mobilized it in, the, in those ways. In, in, in East Houston, one of the things that we have found that I think is fascinating, because we have interviewed a few pastors, and in my I grew up in a very uh, strict Catholic household uh, where I was taught to be homophobic, sexist, all the, all the, all the bad things, good Catholics. Um, and um, so, so I'm used to, when my impression of organized religion is you're going to have some religious leader bang on a Bible about judgments of other people. The, the pastors who we have talked to in East Houston have what I consider to be, and I know I'm not probably not being anthropological right now because I am uh, making a judgment, but they are very resourceful in how they think, for example, about issues of sexuality, right? Uh, that that there there is no harsh judgment in 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 the churches that we have attended, uh, where uh, people simply see it as part of people's lives, uh, and and they just don't go there, right? So so that, that judge so it's not so the, amongst the people who we have interviewed, the the God's will part. So far, I haven't seen what we saw in New Orleans. Uh, New Orleans yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. God, or guys angry at America. Yeah. yeah. It, 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 it wasn't a company because it knew. Yeah. 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 And, and in New Orleans, there's also this this multi-vocality to the narrative of God's will because people because while while some very conservative political commentators were saying it's God's will because of the license, the sexual license of New Orleans, there were also other people who flipped that narrative who said it it's it's God's God is angry at America for the conditions of inequity that Americans create, right? So so there was also that diversity. Now we have not run into that diversity here yet. I'm not saying it's not there. But we haven't seen it. Mostly, I think God's will in East Houston means um, you, you need this narrative to survive because understanding the arbitrariness of, of racism. I mean, I, I think it's really hard. It, it's hard for me to wrap my head around it at times, even though I, I myself experience it. Um, but but when you experience it, you realize no. Some people just get told no. So, so you know, in, in the city of New Orleans, and actually the conversation that we were having last Saturday with former school teachers who were laid off from from the North Forest School District. You know, during, you know, in, in America, it, we, have great, we have great ways of making everything look pretty, right? We call Jim Crow separate but equal. Jim Crow was not separate and equal. It was separate and highly unequal, right? <laughs> in, in the city of New Orleans, the schools that were designated for kids that were called African American systematically received 30 cents on the dollar of the schools that were designated for kids who self-identified as white. When segregation ended, many people who self-identified as white refused to share the schools with their kids and moved out to the suburbs and created their own public school districts. So, so you know, some people say, well, segregation ended in 1960. No, then we entered a period of de facto segregation that we're still living through right now, right? African American, many, not, not all, I mean, there, there are a lot of African American folks who are college educated, who are, who are financially stable. Over half of the people who self-identify as African American in the United States are middle class, but there's also a high representation of working poor African Americans. Um, and, and, the, and they have systematically been denied one of the major mechanisms of opportunity and social mobility in the United States, which is education, uh, right? So, um, so, so when, when you face that kind of arbitrariness, uh, the narrative of God's will, it's not, it's not that you're having a wool pulled over your eyes, it's that, that that's a narrative that you really need to get through this life. Uh, and it's a narrative of resilience, not, not of ignorance. To me, that, that's the analysis that, are, that I'm coming with, and that's one of the the surprises of this ethnographic project, I think, for me. Thank you. Yes, yes. yes. Uh, sort of building off that, thank you so much for sharing your wonderful research with us. Um, sort of building off of that, I'm wondering about one of the popular kind of narratives that emerged um, very recently, the idea of being still strong. Yes. I Mm-hmm. When we say Houston Strong, we all talked about the same thing. 
Yes. Yes, no, thank you for that question. Um, so on Friday, uh, the, the, the three undergraduate researchers that work in this project, uh, we wrote papers on the basis of our own ethnographic surprises, and then we, we created a panel and we went to the Society for Applied Anthropology in Portland last month and we presented our papers. And one of the students from the University of Houston, Mayra Sierra, wrote her whole paper on Houston Strong. Oh. So, so yeah, the great question. And, and she is particularly taking it, at, and she's particularly taking a critical, a feminist critical perspective on the implicit patriarchal narrative of Houston Strong, particularly in the images of masculinity. And, and in our ethnographic interviews, our interlocutors are not necessarily bringing it up, but, it's, but, but, but what she's making the claim is that they are, that because primarily she has interviewed middle-aged and elderly African-American women, and, and it's a dramatically different vision, or it's a dramatically different image of strength that, that, is not, that, that, that is not part of this hegemonic visual discourse of Houston Strong. So people aren't explicitly mentioning it, but, but for, for, for the ethnographers, they can't help but want to engage it in, in critique. Thank you, great question. Oh yes, yes. So I um, really appreciated your talk and and I wanted to ask you to say a bit more about the concept of environmental racism, which is clearly kind of an informing part of your comments, but, but you didn't mention it explicitly. Yes. In particular, I'm thinking about you know, the, the point that you're making about socially conditioned vulnerabilities. I'm thinking about the recent chemical fires in places like Deer Park, um, and the ways in which this residential racial segregation coincides also with a whole variety of other ways that vulnerabilities are exacerbated. Mm -hmm. Yes, no, that's great. Um, so, and, and that's great, thank you for bringing that up. Um, one, of the, one of the official ways in which Houston represents itself, right, and, and, and Bob, the work of Bob Bullard really, really engaged this, right? Like one of the, the self-representation of, of Houston by people like Bayer Sylvester Turner is that the Houston is a, 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 kind of like what uh, President Obama, how President Obama was representing post Katrina New Orleans. So it's a place where your skin color doesn't matter, your social class doesn't matter, everyone can come here and make it, right? And, and certainly Houston is a magnet of people, right? A, a, a magnet representing itself as a place of opportunity. Now, in, uh, in the mid 1980s, when Bob Bullard was doing his research, Houston had had this representation of itself for a long time. And it was claiming, you know, in, in some parts of, of, of the United States, for example, like in New Orleans, uh, one anthropologist, uh, Antoinette Jackson, who self identifies as African American, uh, her, she is one of these people who are who is part of the successful upper middle class African American you know, upper middle class. Uh, when I was in grad school, she was driving a Volvo, right? Uh, you know, uh, and that's because she had already worked as an executive for a self major cell phone company. She just decided she hated the corporate world and wanted to become an anthropologist. Her father was a chemist. Uh, in back in the 1960s, her father had studied at a, uh, an HBCU, which. A, Unlike what Betsy DeVos thinks, that wasn't a matter of choice, right? <laughs> like people didn't go to HBCUs because they chose to go to HBCUs, they were forced to go to HBCUs because our education system was segregated. I can't believe that this person is running, the, right? <laughs> but, but this is our secretary of education. Like, it, it, this is a huge joke, it's funny. Um, so, so he went to an HBCU, he got a degree in chemistry, and um, the way in which he spoke, the, the, the linguistic ideology that conjured in people is that the way in which he spoke, he spoke in a way that for many people indexed whiteness. He spoke in a way that people would expect. Uh, have you all seen the movie Black Klansman? Right? Uh, and and the, what some of, most, a lot of Black Klansman is, is fictitious. Spike Lee took a lot of creative license, but one of the true elements of, of Black Klansman was that the police officer who infiltrated Ku Klux Klan by making the phone calls did speak to David Duke. And David Duke claimed that, that he could never be fooled because he was playing with David Duke when he was making the phone calls. And he was saying, well, Mr. Duke, don't you, and you guys know who David Duke is, right? Yeah. yeah. He, he's, he uh, endorsed President Trump. And President Trump refused to turn down the endorsement, right? I mean, that's where we're at as a nation. And, and so, so David Duke, so, so the police officer was playing around with David Duke. And he was telling him, hey, you know, what, what if I was a black person? Like, how, how would you know that I'm not pulling your leg and I'm not a, a, a white supremacist wannabe? And David Duke was like, well, I would know if a black person called me because black people have certain ways of speaking. And the police officer asked him, well, well how do black people speak? And he said, well, African and black people say things like ara a lot, you know. 
I, you know, they are going whatever, right? And so he said, I couldn't possibly be fooled, right? So that's a linguistic ideology. You think that certain people speak in certain ways. And you think that speaking in certain ways indexes certain kinds of racialized identities. So when Antoinette's father would call potential employers in Louisiana to try to get jobs, uh, he would be given interviews, he would be welcome, but the moment that he showed up at offices to actually get a job and people would see the color of his skin, uh, all of a sudden all kinds of things would happen, right? And he would never be employed. He actually had to leave the South and move all the way to Nebraska to get employed, where I'm not saying that there isn't racism in Nebraska, but it's a different form of racism, right? It's a more covert, implicit, uh, you know, racism, well, uh, very different from the outright bigotry uh, of southeastern Louisiana, you know. Um, and um, so, so there were, so, so that, that kind of denial of opportunity existed, and, and Houston represents itself as a city where that doesn't happen. Houston represented itself as being, you know, this, the city of the, of the South that was unlike other cities of the South in terms of the opportunity that it granted race in ethnic minorities. Now, uh, certainly in Houston, people who self-identify as African-American, according to Bob Bullard's research, did make more money than their counterparts. So African-Americans in Houston made higher income than African-Americans in, say, New Orleans or Atlanta, but there was still a wage disparity between African-Americans and people who self-identify as white, right? So there was still racism. It, it's just uh, less harmful racism, right? But, but, but as, as we see, one of the ways in which this works is that, you know, I really do think that, you know, there are, I mean, again, over half of the people who self-identify as self-identify as African-American in the U.S. Census are considered by the Department of Labor as being part of the middle class, right? So we don't want to create the impression that all African-Americans are dead poor, but there is an over-representation of African people, African-American people living in conditions of poverty and economic marginalization. And, and that is not because these people are lazy, right? That, that's because, you know, people, some, you know, you guys remember Bundy, the guy who was getting his cattle raised, right? And then he, there was a story in the New York Times that he went he did a speech that was extremely racist. He was saying, he actually said at one point that African Americans were better off under conditions of slavery because he had gone to, to, to uh, Las Vegas and he had seen public housing, he had seen the conditions under which these people were living and they were better off being slaves. And people don't live in those conditions because they want to. People live in those conditions because people have gone to great lengths to deny many African Americans in this country opportunity. I mean, that's what happened with... Um, with, with Mike Brown when he got shot in Ferguson. Ferguson is one of these places in the United States where people who self-identify as white have, have jealously guarded the public school system to keep, actively keep black kids out, right? So, so the opportunity has been systematically denied to millions of Americans. And when that opportunity is denied, then that means that you have less income. And when you have less income, then you can't afford the $4 million house in West Houston that was built in that flood sacrifice zone, right? You have to buy within the areas uh, that you can buy. And, and, and those are the areas where um, the Superfund sites, the landfills, and all this work that Bob Willard did, and the petrochemical refineries, right? And in Houston, we have that, right? In Houston, we have the fact that if you look at the demographic maps, um, it's really interesting in terms of the, the, the social landscape. I, I don't know if this has a pointer, but you know, to the southeast is where the refineries are. And how, how many of you, and I'm not here to judge you, and I'm not chastising you, I'm just trying to get a sense because I'm trying to figure out something about ethnographic work. How many of you have ever been to the neighborhood of Manchester? Really interesting and fascinating, right? Uh, go to Manchester. <laughs> we should organize a field trip and go to Manchester. Uh, Manchester is where the refineries are next door to the houses of a predominantly Latino community. And, and when, when the benzene is pumping out of those smokestacks, it's raining right down on the kids. It, it, I got a haircut. What do you guys think? Good? Yay? Thumbs up? Thumbs up? So, so I, 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 I had, there's this hairdresser that I keep on going here in Houston. I think she does a good job. Um, I was talking to her when she was cutting my hair. She grew up in Pasadena. And, and she was remembering her experience of growing up in the city. It's not a pleasant one, right? If, if, you know, I, I love staying, when I'm here, I love staying by Buffalo Bayou, you know, I, I, because I can go to Memorial Park and run, and it's wonderful, and there's, mount, and there's mountain bike trails, and I can live this bourgeois fantasy. Um, <laughs> that is not her experience of Houston. Her experience of Houston is she couldn't wait to get out of Pasadena because of the stench, and the stench was petrochemical pollution, right? That, that the people who are denied opportunity are systematically exposed to. And it's really interesting, right? Because there is this race, racialized class difference in terms of exposure where the white collar, the engineers, the accountants, the executives of the petrochemical industry all live in the west side, as far away as possible from, from the southeast, where, 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 where the same petrochemical complex 
carries out a very different form of its labor, right? So, so it's all petrochemical, but it's different forms of labor, different types of risk, different types of exposure, right? Different distribution of risk of who gets exposed to what. Um, and it's funny because I, I was talking about this and, and the students in my class didn't believe me, so they went and they did some research on their own. And then I got some emails being like, wow, I didn't believe you that there was actually inequities that, that are race-based. And it might not necessarily be a matter of fact that someone is, is actively saying, well, you are Latino and you are black, therefore you must live in these areas. But it's the fact that, 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 that certain long-standing forms of structural racism, like what we're seeing in East Houston, denying African Americans the same educational quality that all Americans should be entitled to, ends up being in, in lesser possibilities for social mobility, greater limitations in terms of where people might live. And in, when people end up living in those localities, those are localities where, where all the, where again, the distribution of risk of the risk society takes place, right? That's where we're going to put the, the waste dumps, that's where we're going to put the, the super fun sites. So yeah, I hope that engages your question. But yeah, thank you for bringing it up. Do you think that um, it, specifically the way housing gets constructed in more like affordable housing in areas that may be more affected by the plans and having that nearby is specifically targeting lower economic sections because that like keeps and then preventing affordable housing in more suburban areas. In the case of Houston, and I think that, that's why it's good to talk about it in terms of specific cases, right? In, in, a, in the case of Houston, people who have worked on this issue claim that, so, so Houston, prides itself in its free market approach to urban development. So there are, there, there are no official zoning codes, like some cities there will be zoning laws that say, no, you can't put a refinery next to a residential area, right? Now, Houston does have construction codes governing things like how do you build within the floodplain, but there are no zoning codes as such. What, what, the, but the way that the, the idea of Houston is, well, let, let the people decide, let the free market decide. So what, what, what people in Houston can do is that they can create what are called deed-restricted communities. That, that means that we leave it up to people to make their own decisions about how they want to live. But deed-restricted communities carry an implicit uh, class base, and class and race are, are inseparable. And that's a, we can spend a whole semester talking about how they're inseparable, but, but just take my word for it right now. Um, so, so one of the things that happens is that it's almost like when we talk about health disparities in the United States, that uh, affluence is, is, is linked at times to certain forms of unhealthiness, but it's also linked to certain forms of healthiness. So when you're affluent, you have more leisure time. You can, you can have more leisure time. You can buy healthier food. You can get better health care. Uh, and when you're working three jobs and not even making $30,000 a year, you're stressed. You're more likely to smoke, to drink, uh, to be depressed, right? And your health goes to crap. Um, and so, uh, where, where, where do I want to get with this? So, so with deed-restricted communities, it takes a lot of work to, to keep a deed-restricted community going. And so you need families who are affluent, who are highly literate and bureaucratic and legalistic skills. So, so that creates a class bias. So in East Houston, and we were just talking about this two days ago with East Houston residents, in East Houston, there were deed-restricted communities, but, but when you're living on the edge, you, working multiple jobs, you're exhausted, and you have been systematically, historically denied a quality education, then you, you might not necessarily have the bureaucratic literacy skills to do things like, you know, make, make sure that the deeds are kept up. So a lot of the deeds are, begin to lapse within historically underserved communities, right? So, so that's one of the ways in which structural and environmental injustice in, in, in environment, in, in, and race-based uh, environmental injustice works, right? That, that we deny people opportunity, we keep them down in all kinds of ways, and, and then they're not like the people in West Houston where you know, maybe only one of the partners in the household has to go out and work, and the other one has, can, can stay at home, and their job is to run the home, but also to attend the civil society organization meetings, right? To, to make sure that, that they stay on top of city politics, and also the political influence, the, 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 the political power that affluent people can, can, can mobilize, right? So, so hell no, you are not putting that waste on. So, so it's a thing, right? Everybody, in, it's just like that book, Everybody Poops, right? Everybody in Houston <laughs> creates waste. Everybody poops. Everybody in Houston creates waste, but it's the people of East Houston who have to deal with everybody's waste, right? And when Bob Buller was writing his book, only two of the landfills in Houston were outside of East Houston, and, and those were heavily fought against by, by very literate, very savvy, very aggressive people, right? Uh, so so that's, that's how it works. It works in all these, um, you know, 
there's a second or third level of, of degree of separation in terms of how structural racism works, right? We undermine your educational system and that it's having effects on where you can afford to live, how you can afford to live. And, and that's the other thing that, 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 that works with environmental injustice. So in, in, places, in places like Mexico, um, disaster researchers have made a case that, that because disasters take form and magnitude along socially created lines of, of economic and race and gender difference, that inequity reduction is a part, should be a part of disaster risk reduction. Now, inequity, some people might say, well, what, what does reducing inequity in income have to do with reducing a disaster, right? We, let's build dams, let's build levees. But, but, but when you begin to understand that people who make less money, they have to, are forced to live in areas that may not be as well situated in terms of things like flood risk, uh, you begin to understand the connection. In East Houston, a lot of families because of their economic marginalization, could not do the proper, what's considered the proper upkeep to their homes. So when a disaster comes, FEMA will then look at their houses and say, well, we're, you're not getting any money from us because the, the damage to your house is from lack of upkeep. It, it's not from the hurricane itself. Therefore, it's not disaster related. And, that's a, and, and FEMA upholds a hazard-focused approach to disaster that is completely at odds with all the social science knowledge on what a disaster actually is. And, and if I were FEMA, I would say no. The inequity reduction is disaster risk reduction. Therefore, it doesn't matter that it wasn't the hurricane that damaged your house. We need to help you. Right? And, and most important, and some people will say, well, Roberto, FEMA doesn't have the resources to cure the problem of inequity. Yes, and that's why we have to think about disasters in a greater sense of reducing inequity. But, but keep in mind that in America, we are enamored. We glorify inequity. We glorify inequity as a representation of a meritocracy that doesn't really exist. Right? So when, you know, I was critiquing President Obama earlier. I'm going to throw him a bone now or a kudos, not like he needs it from me. He's like, who the hell is that guy? I don't even know who that idiot is. <laughs> when, when President Obama left office, you know, that's the thing about him. Like, President Obama is actually a really smart guy. And, and he got to Harvard not because of the color of his skin. He got to Harvard because the guy's really smart and he works really hard. And, um, and like all of us, we, somebody helped him at one point. Right? People helped me a lot, too. Uh, and so he wrote this article leaving his political office and. and the article that he wrote, he actually got data from the Department of Labor. And that data from the Department of Labor said that in the 1970s, the average CEO, the, the average executive in American companies made 25 times what the average worker made, right? 25 times. When he left office, the average CEO made 300 times what the average worker made. And, and we have this narrative in the United States that, well, he deserves it, right? Well, she deserves it, predominantly he, right? But, but no. The, you know, we were going to talk about making America great. The, the, the time period that our current president imagines America was great in was a time period when it was great for some people, not for all. African Americans were systematically kept out of that greatness. Uh, and it was also a time period when the people of his social class paid a heck of a lot more taxes because that's what makes a country great, right? Uh, the, the, the American suburban, homeowning, white middle class is a product of big government programs that were subsidized with federal funds to make sure that, that mortgages were kept uh, at, at low interest rates, and African Americans were systematically kept out, were denied those mortgages, right? So, so yeah, we, we are enamored of inequity, and therefore, and, 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 and Houston, it's a city that I love, but it's also a city where, I mean, it, 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 not everyone in Houston, but certainly Houston is a city where conspicuous consumption matters a lot. Oh my God, there's a bunch of really cool cars driving around out there, right? Ferraris, Audis, man, these cars are awesome, but well, we celebrate that, right? Uh, we, we, we celebrate, we glorify that inequity, but, but that, that inequity is the disaster. So, although, the, the, as, as Dr. Munil was mentioning, although the, the Harvey may have receded and left, the disaster is still here and we're still making it. We're, we're making it because we, we're not having a critical discussion about reducing inequity in, in Houston, or at least we're, we're, the, the policies that have been passed in Chapter 19 uh, are, are actually not going to prevent the actual practices that are engendering flood risk. And, and so we have to understand that although Harvey was something that is serious flashy that came and went really quickly, the, the problems that Harvey pointed to are problems that are endemic to our city, or to your city. I would like it for it to be my city yet, but you know, I don't know if I can get a job yet. I would like to. But they're, they're, inje they're, they're endemic to your city, are still here. They, they still need to be addressed. The we are still living in the disaster right now from the perspective of an anthropologist. Yes. Um, we, in your research, you explored a lot of socioeconomic and we saw that with Katrina and with Houston. Mm -hmm. um, in the case of Houston, how are people of different, I guess, socioeconomic and ethnic backgrounds sort of changing 
how they're preparing for the next disaster. Because like, unique to my neighborhood, I live in Southeast mm -hmm. Houston. Mm -hmm. um, I'm 10 minutes away from Fairland and 10 minutes away from Pasadena. Mm -hmm. So I get the best of both worlds. Mm -hmm. um, the, a lot of my neighbors simply had to take out loans, not even to live in their house, but just to fix what happened. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And unlike in other neighborhoods in the West where they not only they fix their house, but they made sure that it won't ever happen again. Mm -hmm. So like, what are the disparities in how people handled Harvey and how are they preparing for it? Yeah, no, that's, that's a great question. Um, you know, so, so you have places like the East, right, where, where people, the, the discussions that I was having with residents this last Saturday is, in the East, people are still waiting to yeah. get help. So, so they, ha they, they haven't even physically recovered, many of them, that their houses are still in progress. And, and yes, they're, they're, they don't have the, they have, they have the resources to maybe make their houses inhabitable, but not necessarily to raise them, exactly. right? Which will cost like $30,000, yes. right? Um, so, so there's that disparity there. In the west side, um, so in, in the west side, my impression is, so you, you have these huge multi-million dollar homes that people aren't racing, and they're still within the flood sacrifice zone, and people are just gambling. They're, they're, they're gambling that it's just not gonna happen again. And they're buying flood insurance. I mean, so that's the thing. That's how people, that's how it's changing. People are buying flood insurance, right? But, but think about this with climate change. With climate change, this will become more and more. I mean, the, the price tag on Harvey was like 160 billion. And, and with Harvey, this is, this is the new normal. My question is, at what point are the insurance companies just not going to pay? And, and in many cases, they're, they're, they're trying to not pay, right? And, and think about this as well. I mean, so um, some people might be like, oh, you know, you're just a liberal, you know, tree hugger. These aren't li liberal tree hugger issues. Uh, uh, the, uh, your home is the highest investment that the overwhelming majority of Americans will make. This is the life gamble that you make. Do you want to see your life's work be destroyed uh, and, and not get remunerated, right? Uh, and, and not be supported, and, and especially destroyed by conscious decisions that other people made, like real estate developers? The real estate developers play around with risk in that they build in flood prone zones, and the risk they assume is only for as long as they sell the properties. Once they sell the properties, they're out. You bought the risk, right? And then they'll build more subdivisions that are increase the flood risk of the subdivision that you just bought into. Um, so, so in, in the West, people uh, people are rebuilding back to where they were, but that's that's they're still within the flood zone, and, and they're buying flood insurance. Uh, the question is, for anthropologists, is how long does that memory last? Uh, at what point will people begin to say, "Well, I don't need flood insurance anymore"? Uh, you, uh, often, some people say it's about 20 years before memory begins to last. Uh, so. Um, one, one person who I was talking to, who the, the, the gentleman Sal with the with the five five series Beamer and the Porsche on a flooded uh, $4 million home. And, and he, he's right back in terms of the risk that he was at before. Um, he just has flood insurance. But, but, but at, at the same time, uh, do you really want to live like that? Do you really want to just live waiting uh, for the rain? It, for, for, so for other folks who I have interviewed, uh, what's really interesting is that um, among the people who I've interviewed in, in West Houston, it seems, and again, I, 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 I'm, not, I'm being very careful about this. I'm not saying I speak for all West Houstonians, but I get a sense that there's very little flood literacy and that, and that Harvey did, has done very little to enhance her flood literacy. But, but other people who I have interviewed, um, previous disasters like Allison, previous floods like Allison did enhance her flood literacy. So one interlocutor that, that we have, um, she was a single mom going through law school, again, maxed out her finances to buy this historic home and she had absolutely no flood risk literacy. And she bought a, a home right next to um, a, a, water reten a, 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 water, a flood retention wall. And she thought it was ornamental. And, and her experience with, with Allison made her come to see her environment in a dramatically new way, where, where now she's very conscious. But, but even with the interview that we were having, that I didn't read you that excerpt today, uh, she was saying how she benefited from a FEMA buyout, but a FEMA buyout required that she not buy a house within the floodplain. She had to buy a house outside of the floodplain. But the problem is that here's how it happens in Houston. In, in, many, in many parts of the United States, it's the Army Corps of Engineers that develops the flood risk maps. Those maps, from my own experience and research, are usually pretty good. They predict pretty well where it's going to flood. In Houston, um, the, the suspicion, or more than suspicion, the certainty that some civil society leaders have is that 
some highly influential, so, so, some real estate developers who can buy political influence can influence the development of the maps to make sure that their subdivisions are not included within the floodplain. So, so the, 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 the flood risk maps in Houston do not represent flood risk reality. Um, so, it's, and, and even if they do represent flood risk reality, we are altering the hydrology of the region so quickly and so massively that there's also this temporal element that it takes years to develop a flood risk map. And by the time a flood risk map is done, it's already outdated because there's been so much alteration of, of the floodplain that there's no way of telling whether your house is going to flood or not. So my advice to you is if you can afford it, buy, buy flood insurance and keep your fingers crossed that, <laughs> that it doesn't flood and that the insurance companies pay. Yeah, but we'll go to you. Yeah, yeah. So tell me, what's your follow-up? Oh, um, I know that in Katrina, in one of the excerpts that you showcased, it was you know sort of like this community leader seeing his community fade away, and I know that a lot of people who suffered from Katrina evacuated and never came back. Mm -hmm. Are we? Because like, maybe it's because my, my bubble of Houston is so small in my eyes. Like, are people staying? Houston, or like, it, well, you said like, yeah, well, the Houston and New Orleans are very different. So H Houston still offers all kinds of opportunity yeah. that New Orleans didn't. So I, I think Houston remains a magnet for folks. People are moving within the city. Mm -hmm. no. So so a lot of people from East Houston are leaving uh, to go to Humble. And, and they're, they're, from, from what the interlocutors are saying, I have yet to demonstrate this demographically, I'm not a demographer, I'm going to have to rely on the demographers doing the work, there seems to be an ethnicity shift where working class African Americans are moving out of East, moving up to Humble, and then Latinx people are moving in to East Houston. Uh, and, and she's saying it's really interesting because the, the interlocutors who have talked about this have said with Allison, it was the white working class that moved out and the African Americans that moved in, uh, and now it's the Latinos moving in, uh, in, in African American folks moving out. So, so there's certainly movement within the city, but I, but I think Houston remains such a such a power, I mean, it's such a powerhouse of, of job opportunities, life opportunities that, that, that people are leaving, well, unlike New Orleans. New Orleans, what was interesting about New Orleans is that when Katrina, the, the peak of New Orleans in terms of population was 1960 prior to desegregation. And my theory is that once the school systems and public housing were desegregated, a lot of people who self-identify as white would rather leave the city than share it. So it's huge. It's, New Orleans lost 200,000 residents between 1960 and 2005, and it went from having 650,000 residents to 438,000. And when those residents left, it took a lot of tax revenue with them. So the school system in New Orleans was completely decrepit. I mean, it, was, it wasn't a school system. They, they were, if you talk about prison school to prison pipeline, they, they were just holding cells for kids uh, who were predominantly African American. Um, and the social services in New Orleans, New Orleans is a city that we love to go party at, it's a city that people celebrate as a place where life is art, but it's also a city that's extremely harsh on its people, and particularly its poor people of color. Um, so, so a lot of African American residents who left New Orleans also saw no reason to go back, because they found better school systems in Houston, in Atlanta, in Memphis, um, than in New Orleans. But still, the, the, the option wasn't given to them. And the reason why people didn't come to Lower Ninth Ward is, is a complete mess, uh, where, again, how the city of New Orleans, the state of Louisiana, enacted certain forms of racism or of race-based discrimination without, without supposedly even knowing it, maybe they did. Property values in the United States, what your house is based on, has nothing to do with the actual value of a structure in terms of its use value, right? It has to do with supply and demand that is, that is tainted by racist and classist assumptions, right? I mean, I think it's been shown that once so many African-American people move into a neighborhood, price values begin to depreciate. People start trying to move out, right? Because Americans, because our, our, your home is, is your life investment, then people might say, I'm not racist, but my God, this is my only life investment, right? And, I'm not gonna, and, and I can't have too many black people living next to me because then my property values are gonna go down, so I'm gonna sell. Right? So, so uh, racism is a big part of property values and classism is a big part of property values in the United States. When Katrina hit the Lower Ninth Ward, the city of New York, the state of Louisiana, the Home, the Road Home to Recovery Program used property, market property values to determine what money people were given. And that's like saying, we're just going to use racism to estimate the value of your home. What people should have been given, should have been given the cost of actual new construction, which would have been like $160,000 a year. But in the Lower Ninth Ward, because of systematic racism, you could buy a house for $20,000. So people are getting $80,000 a war thousand dollars award for their homes, for homes that flooded for, for, for reasons that were not of their making, and you can't rebuild with that. You just can't. So, so that's how you effectively disband. Now here's the irony. 
the irony is the, the, the people who are most vulnerable are being told, we, we, we will not give you the resources that you need to reconstruct. And I've seen this time and time again in disaster recovery context. Usually the biggest challenge of aid organizations is not that there isn't enough resources to give, it's that they can't give the resources away fast enough. Then there was a scandal with the Royal Home to Recovery that while they're telling African American families that they can't give them enough money to, to actually rebuild the house, they were, they were left with a remainder of $400 million that they couldn't spend. So, so they're, telling, they're telling the most vulnerable people, the people who suffer the most, that, that, they can't re, that they can't be given a resource to reconstruct. At the same time, they're sitting on this pile of gold in the bank. And they're using race-based property values to decide what the awards are. God bless America. <laughs> we'll just go right here because he had nothing to come up. Uh, yeah, well, I have a few questions now. One, choose the best artifact. Is uh, Is the Royal Home Okay, so I understand that after And, and that's, a, that's a great question, and it brings us back to East Houston. Because, and, and, and that's the thing, that a lot of these things were even going on before Houston, so before Harvey. So uh, with our question, what does Harvey, Hurricane Harvey reveal for you? Some of the people who have interviewed in East Houston are, are saying, well, forget Harvey. Let's talk about the closing of North Forest. That's what I want to talk about. That's our disaster. And that preceded Harvey. Right? That, that happened, uh, the specific date, I think it was like 2014, that the school district was, was shut down. Uh, and that had severe impacts on the neighborhood that have also affected what we call the resilience of the community. Because having a school district is, a, you know, in, in disaster researcher, in mean, disaster research, there's this term that we like to throw around called resilience. I think we mentioned it, right? This is part of the resilience thoughts, right? And one of the reasons why I hate the concept of resilience is because the concept of resilience uh, completely, as it is operationalized by people who are in the field of community psychology, completely ignores structural racism, structural violence, completely ignores all this stuff. Basically, the way to define resilience is, resilience is the capacity of a community to rebound after a disaster, right? Or after a shock. Uh, and then they define resilience as the social capital of, of a community, the, the, the strength of social relations among community members. And so if a disaster happens and your community doesn't recover, it's your fault because you didn't have enough social capital. But what if you have a community like North Forest where the social capital of the community was, was actively and consciously destroyed by the state legislature of the state of Texas. That's not factored into, that, that, that's not considered in existing definitions of community resilience, right? It's the fact that, that, that whether a community is resilient or not, it's not because of its own fault that sometimes people get screwed massively in the history of the United States, in the history of the world, right? And, and that's not because they lack certain capacities or qualities, it's because some very powerful people made certain decisions that had tremendous destructive impacts on them. So, so in, in, in East Houston, you know, the, the closing of the school district is something that the, the school itself from the narratives that are emerging was, and that's why I like it because that's why I like this, this particular case because it shows how something that seems to be completely unrelated to disaster, like, the, like schooling and education, is directly related to the thing that we might call resilience. Because when people narrate what the school system did for them, the school system led to people of the community being involved in the community. So parents were involved in parent-teacher organizations. Uh, there were all kinds of um, uh, programs that the school teachers had instituted in terms of workforce education, all kinds of things that, that, that helped them create community cohesion. And when they closed the school district, all that was taken away overnight. And, it, and people narrated it as a disaster. Uh, so, so so that, that's what you're talking about that happened in New Orleans, that was going on in Houston before Harvey even flooded. And people were already living that disaster. Now in New Orleans also, a lot, a lot of these things were already happening, uh, but, but Katrina created an opportune moment where certain processes could be sped up. So for example, the closing of public housing. That, that's, the, that's the other thing, right? Public, again, public housing is not... Public housing is how the state subsidizes very powerful companies that refuse to pay their employees what they work, what they, what, what, what the, the wealth that they produce through their labor, right? And then we glorify uh, inequ inequity saying, well, the, the executives are the ruling class, they have the right to keep the lion's share of the wealth, and you know, whether they have the right to or not, okay, you can decide that if you want, but it's not good for our society in the long run, right? I mean, you, can, you can do whatever you want in this world, right? 
you, you, can, you can be a complete jerk if you want, and you can be completely unscrupulous if you want. Yeah, we're all free to do whatever you want, but there might be consequences for, for what we do, right? And the forms of inequity that we have engendered are the forms of inequity that, that, that end up resulting in a society where our quality of life is heavily impacted, right? And, and when you have people who have been disenfranchised, who have been marginalized, who have been beaten down, some of them will end up doing things that you don't like, right? But it's not because there's, some, there's, something, there's something about their race, which is a cultural construct, that's leading them to do that. It's because of the way they've been historically mistreated, right? Um, and, and so the nine people education, the nine people fair wages is all part of it. But, but with, with public housing, you know, public housing is presented as a gift that's given to people who aren't working hard. The people who live within public housing in New Orleans work. They work jobs. They wash dishes, they did all the crap jobs that nobody wants to make, and they weren't paid enough money. I mean, that, that's, the huge, that's a huge irony, right? That, that, that I'm sure some of you in this room know that, that it is possible to work 40 hours a week in this country, and in particular a city like Houston, and not have enough money to be able to afford to live in a city like Houston. As a matter of fact, you can be a college professor with a PhD and not make enough money to be able to live in the city of Houston, am I right? Yeah? yeah. So, my goodness, what the hell are we doing? Like, how can we call this a society? We, we have, we, what we are is a glorified cage match. And do we really want to live like that? Um, and, and so, so, you know, um, so in New Orleans, the, the public housing, you know, what, when my, I married a woman who, her parents are French and Irish immigrants. She was Cajun, rural, working class. Her father was a firefighter. Uh, her her mater, paternal grandmother, when she was 16 years old, was paired up, she was Cajun, she was paired up with this, this is a horrible stereotype. And, but you know, he was an Irish immigrant and he drank a lot. He was an alcoholic. He was a mess. They had three kids. By the time she was 19, she had three kids. Uh, eventually she left them and she moved to the projects. She moved to public housing. And when, 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 when the projects were designated, when the specific projects were designated by people who self-identified as white, they were great places to live. And it's not because white people were better than black people, it's because the state invested in them. The public housing projects were created to give soldiers coming back from the Second World War a place to live. Because uh, under capitalism as it existed in the United States, the working class, like today, was not paid enough to be able to afford a place to live. When African Americans are allowed to share public housing with people who self identify as white, and the white folks begin to leave public housing, the funding gets plugged, gets pulled. And then public housing begins to go downhill. And that begins to give HUD and Hano the excuse to shut it down. And, it begins, and, the, and the racist narrative begins to proliferate, right? It, like, like Mr. Bundy like, was, was saying, oh, you know, look at how African Americans live. And again, fetishizing, ignoring the, 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 the broader political relations that are, that are creating this, right? The, the, these decisions that are made in Washington, D.C., by, or by, by the housing authorities of, of, of different cities. Um, and, and, so, and, and, and that's the thing about resilience, right? about the resilience narrative. Then, then existing operationalization of the concept of resilience, these kinds of these forms of structural racism are seldom considered or spoken about. It, it's, all, it's just about like what immediate relationships do you people have in this particular community, and do you have enough social capital? If you don't have it, it's because you don't have enough social capital. Let me show you how to have proper social capital, right? Ignoring the fact that the plug got pulled from you maybe 20 years ago uh, by, by a federal agency, uh, and a federal agency that was not subs that was not helping you as a working class. It was subsidizing Hilton hotels, Sheraton hotels, right? It was subsidizing the city of New Orleans and its tourism industry. Oh yeah, thanks for the question. Sorry, went off on a rant, but. I'll ask one last question since we're doing the work of the university here. So in Puerto Rico, it's pretty interesting that there are, there's a, a whole series of sort of emergent, like um, local um, networks of like alternative agricultural cooperative initiatives and like, energy, small networked, really intentional kind of energy, um, what do you call them, little patches, let's say. Do you, have you seen any evidence of any movement like that in Houston, post party, thinking about, like not just saying, oh, you know, the glittering generalities or thinking about, you know, some of the big stru structural issues in the ways you've been talking about. Have you seen people responding by saying, hey, let's, let's figure out how to create like a little alternative solar energy producing community in you know, a particular area 
for um, intentional agricultural kinds of cooperatives to really, you know, take the transformation in political culture, um, push it deeper? <laughs> yeah, I, there is. And, um, and, and I think, again, it shows how um, a, a lot of these, again, if, if, the, if Harvey is not a disaster, but it's the city of Houston itself that is a living disaster, and that's not necessarily a good thing or a bad thing. I mean, you know, it, as anthropologists, we, we hold up a value judgment, right? We just present the contradictions of society and we ask you, do you think those are contradictions you want to uphold? Um, so, so it might seem very critical and negative to call Houston a disaster because at the same time, you know, some people, it grants people opportunity and people live here, meaningful lives and all that stuff. But if we, if we were to think of a disaster as, 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 a, as a history of urbanization and class and race relations in Houston, then it, Harvey was already here in all kinds of ways, right? So gentrification is something that people in places like the Fifth Ward have been fighting. And gentrification is something that, that is speeding up. Uh, when you go to places like the Second Ward, I mean, I, we didn't, you know, this other narrative of, of, of the disaster is the fact that people were being displaced by different kinds of flooding, and one of the, the flooding is the flooding of condos. Because the city of Houston loves the tax revenue of the condos, right? And, and the, these are, you know, I, I live in a little Midwestern town, and I bought a 1,300 square foot home for $90,000, which you can't find anywhere else in the United States. Of course, it's a little podunk town, and most of you probably wouldn't want to live there. But, uh, it, but, but in Houston, I could never afford to find a place like that to live, right? Like these are uh, this affordable housing in Houston, and they're four hundred thousand dollar, five hundred, they're five hundred thousand dollar condos. Like that's affordable in Houston, right? You, you want to live closer to to Montrose? They start at a million. Who's got a million dollars here? Like. You guys don't have a, a rich daddy that'll give you a million dollars to get started, but no interest-free rate, interest-free loan, no, not like you. So, um, so, so the city of Houston loves this stuff. These are, uh, the, the East End Second Ward is one of the oldest Latinx neighborhoods in Houston, right? It's where the uh, Guadalupe Church is located. Uh, these are old folks who can't afford to live in their homes anymore because the property values of the neighborhood have gone up so much that, that the, pro the value of their property has gone up to the point that they can't afford their taxes, so they're having to move, they're being displaced. So this is a flood. It is a disaster that was going on well before Harvey, right? For these people, uh, for this community. Um, so so a, lot of, a lot of these things were already happening, and there, there, there are groups within Houston that have been working to combat gentrification, particularly places like the Fifth Ward, and there are urban gardens, etc. I don't, you know, and, and I'm not here to make a judgment about how effective they will be, but they are facing a tremendous tidal wave, right? Uh, so, so it's good that people are doing these things, uh, but, but the, the tidal wave that, that is coming is huge, right? And, and that gets us back to the point that I was trying to make about, about um, Ulrich Beck's risk society, that Ulrich Beck had this hope that, this hope that, that when we began to realize that climate change affects us all, and the toxicity affects us all, that, that all of a sudden we begin to form coalitions along, class of race and, and, uh, along lines of race and class, and that uh, wealthy people from West Houston would hold hands with people of East Houston, and, and immigrants from various parts of the world who live in Houston, you know, we would all get together and we would all try to solve this problem together. That was very utopian. Uh, Houston, my, our, my ethnographic experiences tell me that's not what's happening in Houston, right? People are becoming entrenched, right? People are guarding their own interests. So, so, uh, but, but, but what, what, what Beck was arguing is that to address the challenges of our time, we, we need to form these forms of solidarity. And, and that, that that's what a society has to have. It has to have solidarity. The, the elite have to have solidarity with the working class and make sure that the working class has enough money and good schools and good health. Uh, otherwise, it all falls apart. And, and it has fallen apart before in the course of human history. And it always ends badly. It ends badly for the elite, right? I mean, the, the, the French elite get their heads cut off, right? Like, it ends badly for the elite. I, I, mean, dude, I, I love elites. I want them to do well. I don't want them to get their heads cut off. Like, don't do this. Don't do this to yourself. You're going to hurt yourself. Like, you, you don't need 14 mansions. Isn't one mansion enough? Like, one mansion's good. You're doing good. Like, do you really need your own private jet? Can't you just fly first class? That's pretty good, right? Like, we have lost all sense of measure, right? I mean, we, we are living in this world of absolute excess that it's not going to end well. And, and I, I'm not a proponent of violence, but I am not in control of what people end up doing, right? Um, so, so, 
But that was, a, that was a proposition that Beck was making, that we all had this great kumbaya moment, we all hold hands, and we all solve the challenges of our time together. It's not happening. So then the, the question is, well, well okay, there's two, there's, two, there's two potential outcomes here. We, we allow it to keep on happening, but I, I don't want to be an alarmist, y'all, but over half of the species on this planet have disappeared, right, within the last century. Uh, climate change is not looking very good. I like to eat. I, I don't want to start to death. That, that's the thing. Like, I, I just don't want to suffer. Uh, so, so, but, but apparently, agronomers are not predicting, like, like scientific people who are not progressive tree-hugging liberals, like, like people who are just scientists are saying, hey guys, you keep doing this crap, you're going to have serious problems with, with food scarcity by 2050. Yeah. Think about it. Uh, flooding, sea level rise, see it's like Houston, I mean, you're, you're already seeing it with, with Harvey, right? And so, so we can either let it all go to crap, or we can try to act proactively start trying to do something about it. But if we are going to try to do something about it, we're going to need this kind of solidarity. Right? We're, going to, we're going to need executives and working class folks and everyday folks and white folks and black folks and Latinx folks. And like, stop putting people in cages. Stop building walls, right? <laughs> Let's, but, but that coalition is not going to emerge organically. We have to make it. And I think anthropology is a key element through the ethnographic process. It's, it's a key element of, of, of making it happen, of the solution. I'm not saying we're going to be victorious. Like, we can't predict the future. Right? I know that for sure. Um, so, you know, but, but, but I think we do have a sense of what's at stake here. And not, I think we better start doing something about it. I mean, we better lighten up.